Lieutenant Colonel Jason Pike is the best-selling author of his memoir entitled A Soldier Against All Odds. And Colonel Pike is a living example of what it means to be just that. Colonel Pike served 31 years in the United States Army, served in Afghanistan, and had to deal with all types of petty military bullshit while he was serving. Colonel Pike also explains to us in this episode what osteomyelitis is and how he has been able to manage living with that over the years. But no, he, 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 matter of fact, he told people, whoever falls out of a run, I want these other privates to go kick their ass on the side of the road and <laughs> while they were running. So he, he promoted it in a way. So no, he was a really hard ass drill sergeant. He was sort of like that drill, that 40, uh, Full metal jacket with me. Uh, osteomyelitis is a bone disease. It happened in my when I was nine years old or so. It my, it dissolved my knee twice. It was infection. Uh, it was a it was one of those rare things, and it was in the seventies. And they had to put these damn painful injections into it. I remember it into the damn knee. It with these je- injections would go straight into the damn knee bone, into the kneecap, and it was pain. I give you. Lieutenant Colonel Jason Pike. Hello, all my delicious truffles out there. Welcome back to the Sex, Drugs, and Jesus podcast. My name is Devannon. I'm your host. I have with me today, Lieutenant Colonel Jason Pike. How are you doing today, man? Hey, doing pretty good. I'm really happy to be on your show today, but I'm really good. Really good. Yeah, I know I'm going to love talking to you. As I was saying before we got on this call, I so rarely get a chance to talk to somebody who was an officer in the military anymore. And so, you know, it's refreshing. We both lived in the military at age 17 and had, had some, some whirlwind experiences. So I cannot wait to dive into this and see how it was for you. I'm going to go ahead and read through your biography here since it's so very well written. So y'all, Jason's a national best-selling author, and his book is called Soldier Against All Odds. Okay, he's a decorated combat veteran with multiple deployments. Lieutenant Colonel Jason Pike served 31 years in the United States Army as both an enlisted and officer. This was nine years of overseas in five different countries. Jason earned over 30 service awards and badges and served a wicked amount of military training thrown under the bus and ghostlighted by his own superiors. Arrests and investigations are big stories here. So this is not your typical military memoir. No, it's not. Not at all. I, I'm a, I was a senior guy, and I'm going to tell you how I rose to the top from the bottom. And from the bottom in multiple ways. And I will tell you my failures and fiascos and I probably got more than most. I'm not, I'm not a perfect penny by any means. I was not a perfect penny. And, uh, there's some things I did that were my fault and some things that were not my fault. Yeah. I love the way you talk about, um, failures. And so let me think about how I'm going to say this. There is a quote that you put from Carlton Fisk at the beginning of your book it says it's not what you achieve it's what you overcome that defines your career oh yeah oh yeah yeah so yeah a lot of people think they've got to be at a very top level and they think they need to go here and it's like they're comparing themselves but really it's what you achieve personally from the baseline not necessarily comparing yourself to others because you're you there's only one you and so you compare yourself just getting going forward yeah now, that what you speak of is counterintuitive to modern-day stereotypical masculinity. I'm going to go down this road here. A lot of people associate, you know, manhood and masculinity with being in the military. When I was in the military, a lot of those guys were very insecure. They did a whole lot of comparing and things like that. How did you manage to... Keep your own mind, you know, your own opinions, your own, you know, how did you get to this, to this place where you understand that the race is really against yourself and not anyone else? 
Yeah, in the beginning, I did compare myself, and I was, you know, I thought, you know, I'm not like them, and I, I can't rise to that level. I felt insecure in many ways. Um, and then I said, you know, um, almost being kicked out of basic training a long time ago, I thought, you know, I can achieve things, and I, and I have to do it my way. I, it might take me a little bit longer, and I may not get a degree in four years it may take me five years and it may take me longer to do things but i have to do it my own way if i'm gonna you know achieve my personal goals which were to stay in the military and to achieve rank and things of that nature uh, that took me a while to figure out that it's i can only be me and i can't really be them uh, and I, I didn't i didn't walk the walk they walked i walked my own walk yeah uh, that caused me some tr troubles as well, but no, that took me a while to figure out. And I says, you know, that's just the way I am. And that's the way I got to go. Yeah. That right there, what you're talking about is mad freedom, yo. Like to have that awakening, to understand that it's not actually about other people. You know, yeah. I, I, I pray more people come to that, come to that awareness. So the one thing that intrigued me in, in the testimonial that you wrote about your book at the beginning of it, which I'm going to read if you don't mind. Um, Go ahead. Which, yeah. has, which has everything to do with um, how taxing it was to go through the process of writing. There's a huge physical aspect and emotional aspect that comes along with writing, especially a memoir, because this is not fiction. We're not making shit up as we go, which is nothing wrong with doing that. I love me some science fiction. Godzilla fan here all the way through and through. <laughs> Godzilla is real. I don't care what anyone has to say. <laughs> uh, but, but you really go through some changes that when you write a memoir. It takes longer to write a memoir than it does to write fiction, although one would think since you're writing about yourself or you could just, you know, you lived it, you could just write it down. It's not like that. So you got to be sure all the facts line up. You have to be, you have to write it at a pace where you can emotionally handle it. And so, and then you relive everything. So I'm going to read this here. Now, this is um, from Lieutenant Colonel Jason, his own testimonial, testimonial in his book about this writing process. And he says, uh, and I quote here, writing this memoir damn near killed me. In February 2021, I was admitted to intensive care at the Stone Oak Methodist Hospital in San Antonio, Texas, suffering from blood clots in my lungs and legs. And an off-duty physician's assistant told me probably tell me privately, probably outside the boundaries of formal rules, that I would likely die, and he advised me to sign a DNR or do not resuscitate, since the death that I was facing would likely not be a comfortable one. Mm, the clots were formed as a consequence of sitting behind a computer for long hours and the stress caused by stirring the sediment of so many mixed recollections. Besides that, a bout of pneumonia further complicated the situation. Floods of memories were returning of past issues with the law of myself breaking many established rules, protocols, and the many failures that char char characterized my journey, the consequences of which I faced, but also simply escaping death, just as I did more than once mo most recently with that hospital visit. Yeah. Yeah. End, end quote. So, a couple of things to unpack there. How did it feel to have a doctor tell you, look, Jason, your ass is going to die and it's going to be a bitch of a death. So let's just wrap this shit up. So, so I, I felt when he said I was going to die, I felt he was being so honest with me. And I, and I knew my father had died a, a long death and I saw him die that way. And I know that I didn't want to die that way. In other words, just stay on a respirator and and i understood that and i was really appreciative of that and yeah yeah and so i felt uh, he was being very honest with me and he did it privately he says because he, he did he, he, i think he was he was off duty he said you know and he, but we were alone he says you know this is going to be bad death if you don't sign the dnr it's just going to go on I, and i understood that i don't know well a lot of people would understand that that, that i appreciated it and it would i got my obituary and made sure that uh, we knew, you know, where I was going to be buried and things, but I thought, but my body came back, it came back. Uh, and so I'm, 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 all, I'm alive and ticking, but I, I thought that was a pretty cool, I, I enjoyed that. I, I, I'm glad that he was, he did that. I wish I knew his name, <laughs> but I don't know his name. 
Maybe not, because if he just <laughs> went off the record to tell you this, and we'll just call him John Doe. John Doe. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So talk to me. Talk to me then about going to the military. First of all, first of all, thank you to all the veterans out there and all the current active duty people, because not everyone has the nutsack, okay, to go to the military and to deal with all the bullshit that comes along with keeping this country safe. Far too many people celebrate 4th of July, Memorial Day, you know, different veterans things without actually taking the time to say a prayer for veterans, to really give a fuck about veterans. I get pissed off when I go places and they don't have military discounts or veterans discounts or nothing at all. Uh, because without us, there would be no United States. And so, and that's a real fact. We have enemies here now and many more who would come over here and fuck up our shit if they could. But the, the, armed, the armed forces and the uniformed forces keep enemies away. So I just wanted to speak a word of commendation and appreciation to all of us who were bold enough and unselfish enough to go and put our lives, our mental lives, our mental health, our emotional health, and everything on the line for this country, even though not nearly enough people act like they understand that. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, yeah, it was a hell of a life. In uniform, 31 years, started from the bottom in multiple ways. I can, I can tell. When I grew up, I had a diagnosed learning disability. Reading and writing are my worst subject, believe it or not. Um, I, I don't know if I'm dyslexic or have an Os Osperger sy syndrome, but no, academics were my worst subject. And I just kind of, I just worked. I worked. This is a, this is a book about never giving up. It's a different way of never giving up. I never gave up on many things. Of course, I had a lot of problems, but this is an inspirational memoir and it's written in a form from the South, that's raw. It's out there. And so I think, and I'm the narrator in it, and I'm the author. Okay? And, and it's a, considered a national bestseller. It's right now, right now, it's number four on Army Memoirs on Amazon. So, yeah, pretty proud of it. Yeah. As you should be. No, the, 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 the disease that you, that you were referencing when I was researching you, I, I came across um, osteomyelitis. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. That's, the, osteomyelitis is a bone disease. It happened in my, when I was nine years old or so, it might, it dissolved my knee twice. It was infection. It was a, it was one of those rare things. And it was in the seventies and they had to put these damn painful injections into it. I remember it into the damn knee with these injections would go straight into the damn knee bone and to the kneecap. And it was pain and my knee blew up. It was pus. It dissolved. And then, uh, the, the, the damn thing grew back. It's, it's my left knee is bigger even right now. And a lot of people will think, how in the hell did you get into the damn army? <laughs> because of your knee problem and your learning problems. Well, I lied. I lied about my knee problem. I told them, I'm good. No problem. This was before the internet where they couldn't check anything out. Regarding how I got into the army through the entrance test, I had no idea. I wish I I, I went into the National Guard, which was, we called that the Nasty Girl. And then I slung, I slung my way in that way. I think they just passed me through. They said, hey, dude, you're just, we want you. We need numbers. And we're not, it. Yeah, it's not real army, right? So you just come on in. We're, we're weekend warriors. And then from there, I went into active duty where I didn't have to pass an entrance test. Now, so I, yeah, kind of just slid my way in. And it was a, you know. Yeah, that's how I did that. You know what? <laughs> however, however you, <laughs> you were able to do it, you still do it. That's what I call determination. So speaking of, you know, lying to recruiters, when I was in the Air Force, you know, I did six years in the Air Force and I was a recruiter for three of those years. No, I did not lie to my recruits, but I did lie <laughs> to my superiors. Because my superiors, my superiors wanted me to lie to recruits and I refused to do that. And so, um, so just a, a word to people out there, you know, the, the, the federal government does not have access to your medical records. They cannot go and dig through, you know, your doctor's visits and things like that. And so when recruiters are asking you things like, um, you know, what drugs have you done, you know, and this and that, you know, if you don't have to tell them if you've done crystal meth and heroin, don't go to the military if you still have a problem because they're just going to throw you out. 
but don't let them disqualify you for some shit that they have no way to verify. You know, I'm not saying lie about asthma and all of that, but what I am saying is whatever you, your criminal record they can find, your educational record they can find, anything health related, bruh, they don't fucking know. As I'm just going to leave that there and do with, do with it what you will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I said, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. No problem. And I didn't even, I was 17 years old anyway. So yeah, so I, I didn't know a lot of what's going on. So, but no, I did get in that way. I went to the week. I was a weekend war before I went on to active duty. Yeah. I, I started everything from the bottom. I had to go to a community college and then transferred into Clemson University, the Tigers in South Carolina. So I, I had to build my basics up of academia that I didn't have in high school. And then I did not get an engineering degree. It was an educational degree, something easy. But whatever it took to get to that goal, I would just work it slowly and methodically. And, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people say, well, how did a dumbass like you do all this shit? And I think, you know what? Everybody said that. So I said, I'll write a book about it because everyone's asking the same damn question. You know, we all know about how that motherfucker get to that level. And I think, well, okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a book. Oh, I don't want to read the fucking book. I said, okay, well, whatever. How about the audio book? Okay, well, yeah, so, but no, that's kind of, because it was just a, it was a wild life. And uh, I just thought, wow, this would be an inspirational book. Yeah, a life. Yeah. It, it really, really means a lot when you record your own audio book, as I did mine. People like that authenticity, uh, the hearing the words spoken with the emotional charge that comes with the actual author who lived it so i commend you for taking the time to write your to, to write your own lord jesus to to fucking to speak your own audiobook because like emotionally to go back to write a memoir is very taxing as we were talking about doing your te testimonial because y'all when you write a book you got to go through that bitch like 10 20 times at least re-editing rewriting every time you go back and read it again it's like you're reliving everything you went through again and then you sit down and you narrate your own audio book. Well, then that's just one more time that you're reliving it again. Now, all this is very cathartic and healing, but it's sticky and uncomfortable first. Mm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Damn near killed me. I would prefer to go to Afghanistan than, do you know, I, it's done, but it was a dream and it was hard. I mean, in my, I feel that I put the icing on my life, my cake, it's there. It's, it's in some libraries and things. I, if I ain't dying today or tomorrow, I was just like, I've done, I've done so much. Um, I've done so much. It's there. It's for history. It's for legacy. It's for my father. I dedicated it to my father. But exactly, like, just like you're saying, this damn thing was one of the hardest things I ever done in my life. And, uh, and so, so I, 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 I'm pretty cool with it. But uh, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's it was a hell of a feat. I look at memoirs now, if they're honest. I look at, I, I, I admire people who do a memoir uh, more than I ever did. I always love documentaries and biographies and memoirs, but, um, but you know, I, now I know for sure that this is a, it's a hell of a job to do. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't call that an understatement like that in many stretch of the imagination, but so would you say that your book is not just for people who were in the military or have a military interest, people you know, very many different lifestyles can take inspiration from your story, even if they have no interest in the military. Oh, yeah. This is a lot. See, this is set up a little bit differently where it's my life. I'm not go I'm not telling you I went to Afghanistan and killed a 100 Taliban. This is a life of love, hatred. This is a life of fighting. This is a life of the emotions of life, sadness, jealousy, uh, heartbreak. This is a life. Uh, just it's a life in the uniform, and I come out with all those emotions of life that we all have in many ways. And it's an inspirational. It's um, everything from breaking laws to getting thrown under the bus, you know, being backstabbed by your own people, your own military. So I have many, many venues of a life in uniform, and the theme is just never giving up and just surviving, uh, and just persistence and grit and. That you're going to see that come out over and over. Yeah. Not a Navy SEAL. Not, so I know a lot of people think these special operators and things of that nature are like the never quit people. I'm in a different form of never quit. It's because uh, I'm coming from a, 
a, a level that's a lot lower and then rising up through the ranks and going through many failures and fiascos that will uh, maybe give you inspiration and hope, regardless of what phase of life we're still in or what have you. Colonel, what I, what, Colonel, what I would like to know is talk about some of these, these backstabbings because the military can be quite petty. <laughs> They could be quite, quite petty. When I was when I was an Air Force recruiter, let me see. Do I really want to get that serious with it? <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna get that serious. But I'm gonna say this: I had bought some Krispy Kreme donuts in when I was working on C-130 Hercules aircraft at Davis Monthan Air Force Base in Tucson, Arizona, because I bought the donuts because I was late. I think I was only late twice in my fucking six years in the Air Force. I was probably hanging out at the club, you know, and had woke up late, probably at DV there at Tucson, just twirling around as I do. I've set these damn things in the electronic warfare office on the flight line. Crew chiefs seem to have a run of it. A crew chief is the kind of like the coordinator or the office manager for the whole plane. They coordinate things. They can't really fix shit or do anything, they just kind of like coordinate everything, but yet crew chiefs have this high pedestal that they're placed on. So when we're out for the morning formation, you get to the office, you check in, you got to go line up in formation, do like the roll call, and you go back into the office and start the day. Fucking donuts are gone. Okay, we see the crew chiefs are running out. They didn't took the donuts, ate them. They're still golf stuffing, chewing on them. They had torn the box up and they're trying to run out to the trash. That type of shit. Now that's some evil, evil devil flare of hell shit. How are you going to steal a man's Krispy Kreme at 6 a.m. chewing their face? Okay. <laughs> that's the worst thing anyone's ever done to me. <laughs> but I can break that one easy. <laughs> I can break that one. In. <laughs> no. So once you become a senior person in the military, it's hard to get rid of them. You're kind of set in. If you're like, a, maybe you're a staff sergeant or above, or maybe you're a, a captain or above, and you've got your time in, other than getting a bad evaluation, uh, I didn't know this until it happened to me. I had been, I was a lieutenant colonel. I was a senior officer in South Korea. It was my third time being in South Korea. I was no stranger to South Korea. South Korea is a station we go to. It's a regular fixed station that would go and defend the region, what have you, and do our tours there. I was over there. And I went over there on my third tour. I brought my family over there. And I walked into a situation that was basically a turf war. In other words, I'm in a, I was in the medical department and they wanted me to do some research and things that were not in my line of competency. And I was more of an operation operation. It was a it was a professional discussion and I said, you know, I think I can do better doing this. Thing. I, it was a professional disagreement. No, no fighting. It's just, this is what my strengths are. Well, they didn't go very well. And I found myself facing various wicked accusations and events that occurred over a two year, two and a half year period of time. So I was a Lieutenant Colonel. And so my, I had a, a Colonel supervisor, female, and I had a Colonel retired. Uh, he just retired, but he had a lot of power play. Yeah. He had been there for a while and he had a lot of power play. Um, first accusation was just a, a, a rumor. I was a pedophile on post. So that rumor went around Young Song years and it was only a rumor. Okay. And they, the colonel put it out to other people and I had to face that, which was nothing ever really, nothing happened at all. Well, once that rumor, so they were doing things to try to stir up shit to get you out. They can't, they can't, you do about it. Well, they, they don't want you there. They don't want you. They don't like it, but they want you to get moved, but you just can't move in the military as a senior person. You got to have people to do, do all this certification and so. Well, once that didn't work, I went from a pedophile to being a spy within one year, about a year and a half. So. The spy, I was, I was brought up on charges of subversion and espionage against the U.S. government. So this was more official. Uh, it went through a hotline. I, I guess they have hotlines for everything. They got hotlines for suicide. They got hotlines for criminal activity or suspicious activity. 
mine was subversion and espionage against the U.S. government. And I had to go and face the wind against charges, false, bogus charges. Criminal Investigation Division of the Army was involved, and he had the military intelligence that was involved. And I had two different briefing rooms. One was up on Young on Yongsan Hill, and there in Seoul, and Yongsan Garrison. My, my commander was being briefed simultaneously while I was being briefed in two different rooms by the CID, Criminal Investigation Division, and the Military Intelligence Division. Bottom line was nothing ever happened. I went through two years of basically hell, people following me around, uh, phone, uh, computer crashes, all kinds of crap. I had to go see my criminal, uh, my defense attorney. And basically there was nothing there, but they tried to find it. And it was just because I didn't play the game what they wanted. And, uh, they didn't like it. And so that yeah, I didn't. And so, uh, and I had to face that now. They did do their job of making people question who the hell I was and what to do with me. My reputation went really bad, uh, and they didn't know really. So my assignments managers or people at the top in Washington, D.C. or wherever they're at, they didn't know what to do with me. Uh, but there was, see, there, was no, there was no charges. I eventually left South Korea. Once I left South Korea, that only that one little group of people, everything went away. There was no more. That was the only time in my life. Uh, so. When you hear someone, this is guys going through an investigation or this, we automatically think they've done something wrong. Uh, we automatically falsely think, but that a lot of times nothing, nothing really, it's not at that, you know what I mean? I was not on the television or radio. It was more kept down. But if I was on the television or radio, it would have drove me crazy. But that was a very difficult time to go through. And I have one chapter just devoted to that. You know, as they say, I mean, if you don't have enemies and people working against you, then you ain't really doing much. <laughs> you know, if when you're headed from, from Jesus to, to whomever you want to reference, unless when you're actually a force for good, the devil is going to get in people and just try to fuck with you. Okay. And that's just the way it goes. And there's just really nothing more I can say about that. You know, People, people are something, you know, as, 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 as my spiritual leader would say when she was, you know, physically, you know, her physical form, people are something. Um, but all that did was refine you, strengthen you, help to build your character. Like our enemies don't even realize that God is just using them to make light workers and people who actually give a fuck about community and people stronger. Everything they threw through against you just made you you know, help, help, help to lay the foundation for the man you are today. They, they didn't hurt you. They didn't kill you. You finished your career honorably. Everything worked out fine. And then they left there looking silly. Yeah. As a matter of fact, it gave me determination to go to, when I went to war in Afghanistan, my shirt, one of my sergeants gave me the shirt when I was, uh, but uh, he, what I felt, I'm going to show them, I'm going to show them, I'm going to go to combat. And you know what, when I went to combat, I'm going to do the best I can possibly do to show them. And then I did. I went there and I came back honorably. I had a bronze star, but more importantly than that, I felt like I was redeemed. In other words, I was I was a piece of shit. I was really a piece of shit out of South Korea. Then, oh, by the way, you're going to go take a unit in Afghanistan. I thought this is a way I'm gonna I'm gonna show them now. And I did. I'll come back once I came back. And everything I had best evaluation ever in my life. I was probably working off of just revenge. I'm gonna show them, not necessarily like. Yeah, well, we did well in Afghanistan. We accomplished a mission, all that stuff. But in my mind, I was thinking, I'm going to show, I'm going to come. And once I came back uh, from from Afghanistan, it was like, whatever you want, man, you're cool. What what assignment? You, I've never had that. In my, we can you can go to any assignment you want to. I said, well, I'll go to Germany, drink some beer, and just retire out of there. And uh, no, I was redeemed from the dead out of there. <laughs> so that was that was uh, actually a good. And then I, I honorably was honorably uh, you know discharged and got all the courses whatever that's because you passed the test you know when, when when people around us are being tacky brute basic bitches you know you know we got to keep it classy you know you know when they go low as michelle obama always says you know when they go low we go high we cannot we can't lower our vibration you know down to these bottom feeding ass assholes around us we use them for what they're worth 
which is to help refine us and strengthen us and lift us up. And then we discard them and we move on and leave our asses back there in the dust somewhere licking the ground, which is what they seem to all like to do. Your story, it reminded me like the whole pedophile thing. When I was, when I was 17, and I want to get into your mind about whether, whether or not you felt any incongruence when you were 17. I don't know that I recommend going to the military for 17, but maybe it was different since I'm queer and everything. But, you know, I was 17. One day I was walking up the steps in basic training and this Asian dude was walking down the steps and he had his dog tags hanging out his battle dress uniforms. I don't know if it's the same thing in the army, but in the air force, you may as well have just like, I don't know, shot the commander in the head. They make a really big deal out of your dog tags and not being inside your shirt. Of course, everything in, in basic training and really in the military is a big deal. Everything is the chicken little syndrome is for real. And so just as a re reaction, I reached out to kind of like touch them and tell him that they were in outside his shirt and he pulled away from me like I was trying to grab his tits or something. And then this whole rumor started that I was like this sexual predator. Okay. <laughs> And then the, the the drill instructor was giving me this fake eye look like like I'm just some nasty hoe and just trying to molest these boys. And I'm all like, okay, I'm 17. I'm a virgin. The least experienced person out of all 60 of these grown ass men who have wives and, and they were coming up to me, showing me pictures of their boyfriends and getting into gay conversations that I was not trying to have. Okay, I didn't report this. I didn't say anything. But suddenly I was the youngest most effeminate you know of all probably the only effeminate one in there but i'm the one who's molesting grown-ass men who are, who are taller than me physically more developed than me because they're older than me i couldn't make them do anything eventually the drill instructor got on to the bullshit okay <laughs> and then it's interesting when people accuse us accuse us of shit we didn't do and then when the truth comes out it's like the very people who they once convinced that we were evil. Those people turn against our accusers. <laughs> Interesting how it backfires on them that way. Yeah, I don't know any repercussions. I do know I changed the names of those people that my nemesis, my enemies, there was only a few of them. I do know I was in a small public health specialty that if anybody was in that specialty and they're my age or even young, figure out who. Who was behind all this stuff? It wasn't that we kind of know. There's not, not that many full colonels. There's not that many people in our specialty and um, people who are even related. Can, they can say, well, uh, is this guy? And there are some people says, is this this person's name? I said, yeah, it is now. So, but uh, yeah, uh, it was a wicked thing. I think, uh, you know, throwing people under the bus, backstabbing. I think that goes, you know, that's, I, I didn't know it would occur in professional organizations at that level i never knew that happened now yeah it's par for the course anywhere you go i've come to realize that it doesn't matter if it's fucking two people working at a burger joint one of the bitches is probably going to be petty <laughs> you know at the end of the day so when you were 17 did you feel like you couldn't it was hard for you to relate to the other people in boot camp and in the military did you really not find that i found the adjustment curve for me was stupidly ridiculously difficult it was hard for me to drink the damn water coming so fast out of the fire hose, meaning the, all the instructions, the acronyms. It was sort of a haze. And uh, when I was 17, I, that's when I joined, I went to basic training. And I had a few trusted friends around me, but I really didn't have much time to even really develop much friendship than just one or two people because we were up at four in the morning and we were going to bed at 11 o'clock at night. It was nonstop. And it was hell. And matter of fact, I almost got thrown out when I was 17. Um, they did a drug deal. It was basically a drug deal. This does not happen in the military. It's in my book, but this does not happen. They sent me and another soldier, the sorriest, the uh, worst privates, uh, to a criminal correctional facility. Not that we did anything criminal. It was basically a scared straight type of a program to where it was different level of hell where they could, you know, maybe see if they could break us or make us. One guy broke, I stayed in. Uh, more importantly than that, he was trying to, we were used as guinea pigs to the entire platoon to say, you know, if you, if you got all you guys, you don't get your shit in order, we're going to send your ass over to CCF, Criminal Correctional Facility, for this hellacious program that we went through, obstacle courses, a gauntlet of 
screaming and yelling and making big rocks into small rocks. It was an exercise to really either get us out or to make us and also improve the entire platoon. But when I was 17, I didn't know that the situations you had as far as relating. Uh, we were in South Carolina. We had a bloody platoon. Most everybody was 17 or 18 years old that went there. So, uh, and we sort of had the same vernacular, the same type of, yeah, the same type of language and things of that nature. And it was, there was not a whole lot of time to even make friends or to have anything petty going on between us much. I did, I did get in a fight with someone. I, I threw his ass to the ground, but he, he came, sleep is very precious. Food is very precious. And so uh, there was this guy, he came in and acted like he was a drill sergeant screaming. And he was, he was just another private. And I was sleeping, and uh, and so I, I saw him. He woke me up, and so I, I I threw his ass to the wall lockers and threw him on the ground. And then I started beating him up, and everyone pulled me off. But at that point, that I didn't get in trouble for fighting. I, and believe it or not, out of forty people, no one said a word to the drill sergeant we were fighting. I think at that, like, well, drill sergeant probably would probably promote me if he knew that I was fighting. He just loved that type of stuff. That was a different culture at the time, and he loved people fighting and you know, all hell breaking loose and stuff. But no, that's no, I didn't have those issues when I was joining the military at the age of 17. <laughs> that's good for you, but it tells me a hell of a lot about that man if he enjoyed fighting what, what sort of hell was living up in him. <laughs> yeah, his name was Ellenberg, I guess, picture in the book. But no, he, 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 matter of fact, he told people whoever falls out of a run, I want these other privates to go kick their ass on the side of the road and while they're running. So he, he promoted it in a way. So no, he was a really hard ass drill sergeant. He was sort of like that drill, that 40, uh, full metal jacket movie. Uh, and it was just exactly the setup on my basic training. You had the open bay barracks and you had the wall lockers. Everything was set up. The, the, the cussing, the screaming, the, the language and the, just the in middle were all there just like full metal jack <laughs> like all i remember from that delicious movie was this is my rifle this is my gun yeah, this is right. and <laughs> that did happen that did happen there, and so there was a guy who called it a gun this was before the movie it was 1983 so i don't know where he's in so yeah and he had to sit up there we had to watch him say this over and over and over this is my rifle this is my gun this is for fighting this is for fun and he had to point to his penis. This is my, you know, what hanging out there and like that. But he had to point to it. And then he had a rifle. And this is my, yeah, this is my rifle. This is my gun. This is for fighting. This is for fun. Yeah. And we had to sit there and watch it for about 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'll never tire of, of, of that scene because you know, they were actually grabbing their dicks, I think, in the movie. <laughs> I can't believe that they were grabbing them. And so. Uh, <laughs> I was sitting there with my popcorn, like, oh, cool. okay, okay. I, I love everything about this. <laughs> yeah, you. that brings back memories. I tell you what, just the just the what they did. So no, there was some people that did suicide, not in my unit, but in some other ones. But it was field artillery. We were combat arms. It was 1983. It was yeah. It was just a different. Shoot. It was a different setup. Different setup. When you say suicide, do you mean suicide drills or committing suicide? With Attempting suicide with Brasso. That was in another battery. That was in another battery that went down. They would get the Brasso, clean your whatever your your brass, and they drank the damn things to try to commit suicide. I guess they just went there. What they did is, I think they just went pumped their stomachs out at the medical facility, brought them back, or or maybe kicked them out. I don't know. But they would, you know, if you tried to kill yourself, they would think that you're damaging government property and you might get an article some sort of an article what have you i mean even if you had a sunburn and you didn't protect yourself or whatever that means you're, you're damaging government property that's what they talk to us about so you know you got to follow the rules and you can't get in trouble or whatever all this stuff so no it was just wild the, the the culture at that time was kind of wild compared to now you know yeah because i know that if i'm not mistaken then they used to like smoke weed and shit back in the day Back in the seventies, well, you know, I, yeah, the back in the, yeah, before, well, yeah, what I hear was, you know, weed and drugs were just all through the barracks. So not yeah. where I was at, not at Ellen basic training, but that was in the seventies is what I hear over and over and over. It's like, that was just a normal thing that occurred years ago. That was during the drug times of the seventies. It was a, it was a sorry time for the military, really. Uh, 
that turned around some, somewhere in the 80s. Talk to me about Afghanistan. How many times did you deploy there? I only went there one time. So Afghanistan, I was in a period of hell just before I went to Afghanistan. My mind went right because my father had passed away right when I was going there. I did go see his funeral. And I was undergo I had I had just gone through that federal investigation, which kind of threw me on my, you know, threw me down the floor. And so I had multiple stresses before I went to Afghanistan. When I went there, uh, I was a commander of a public health type of a unit, and I, I couldn't really think very. I kind of wanted to die over there anyway. I said, this is what I want to die. I want to go see my father in heaven and, you know, get rid of this pain that I'm in. Uh, and I wasn't scared. Unusually, that's not a good thing. You want to be scared, but I wasn't scared. I kind of had a death wish in a way because I'd already gone through a lot of hell up to that point. And yeah, we had incoming rounds. Uh, like four or five times a week, and, and and we had I saw an IED blow up a Humvee, a improvised explosive device, just 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 blow everyone away. But I never went to any type of funerals or events to honor the dead or anything because my focus was just to get the hell out of there. I think we did very well, other than those occasions that occurred. The 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 bombs that came in, the indirect fire, were mortars. They would just blow up the airfields, the dining facility, and just various things. They didn't. It was kind of like just pointing it and just hoping it would try to trigger something. But uh, then they would run away or it, they'd be gone. And, but no, really, it was not a bad tour. It was kind of like Afghanistan was sort of a redemption period for me. And uh, I, I, I really, in Afghanistan, I was just trying to get over a lot of the other stresses that occurred previous in my life. Uh, and I did, we did, we all did well. I, I did tell the soldiers that my father died and I was not right. And they, they took extra care of me. I, I, I give them that. They, they took extra care of me. So, no, we did very well. I might dare say all of the shit you went through before going to Afghanistan may have helped to prepare you to live in that tough environment. Yeah. And we, we did prepare. Like when you just, you just don't go to war. You just don't go to well, you have to go through a procedure these days. Well, at least when I went in, you had to you had to go get validated to show your competency as a soldier again over uh, and you, you you go through you do extra training before you even get there. So we had a whole lot of preparation. Yes, and I had so that was the only war zone. I've been to El Salvador twice, which was hazardous duty, but Afghanistan was a true war area that I went into and uh uh but no, I could have declared mental health, and I thought about doing that before I went to Afghanistan. But then I talked to my uncle, and he said, what would your dad think about you declaring mental health and trying to get out of the war? And, uh, and so I just, I just bit the bullet, and I said, okay, I'm going to go ahead and go and just do the best thing. And I'm going to I'm gonna tell the soldiers that, you know, yeah, help me out, man. Help me out, then, because, uh, you know, I, this is tough for me. Just not that it's Afghanistan, but more dealing with my father's death. And then that bullshit federal investigation, right? So, yeah, I had a whole lot of things on my mind while I was there in Afghanistan. Did you kill anyone? No, I did not kill anyone. Uh, people tried to kill me and us with the indirect fire. So we would, we would, the indirect fire would come out and come down and we would, there would be an alert. Then we would run to these above ground bunkers. That occurred five or six times. And it seemed a, a week. Five or six times a week, and that was that was just a regular thing. It, it seems like it occurred between five in the afternoon and ten o'clock at night. We so uh, so we were sort of like, okay, when is it going to happen? We just ran out of it. I walked out of my bunker. I'm like, uh, come on, I, yeah, man. I'm saying, where are you at, sir? Where the hell are you at? <laughs> you need to get in the bunker. I said, all right, or whatever. And then so uh, and so, but no, that that happened a lot. Yeah. Did you have the same? Uh, Job classification the whole time you were in, or did it change? It changed. Um, I, I, when I enlisted, I was field artillery. Um, then when I went on, field artillery is putting bombs down range. That was just a weekend warrior or National Guard. When I went on to active duty, initially, I was a chemical defense person, a chemical officer, you know, nuclear, biological, chemical defense. And I didn't like that at all. And so I, when I, I, did, I changed as an officer, as a, 
and on active duty, I changed into medical service corps as a public health, a preventive medicine officer. I think in the Air Force, they call them bees, uh, bioenvironmental folks. But I was, you know, water, food, sanitation, inspections, things that get soldiers sick out there, food, water, all that type of stuff. So I was in a unique specialty of, of, of the Army, Army Medical Department, public health. I stayed in that probably 20 years. So most of my time wasn't. Do you, can you recount what's the most bizarre, craziest thing that you saw or that you experienced when you were in Afghanistan? Yeah. Uh, the most bizarre thing would be personnel problems. I was a commander. I think the, just dealing with certain personnel in my unit was just wild. I guess when you take people away, from their hall and you got them stressed they do crazy things and um whew, i had a really really pretty soldier who was doing she was doing damn poor in, in, in a war zone and uh she, the reason she was caught was that she they did the damn video someone left it on the damn computer and, and then they showed it to me and so she was we had to transfer her ass away to another unit uh, to get rid of her because of the shame and uh, Scarlet A, but uh, that's, that's weird, but she was one of the best soldiers I've ever commanded ever, but she just did something stupid. Um, that would be one thing. Another, I, I had another soldier who was supposed to be my executive officer. He was a captain. He'd been 20 years. He had 10 years enlisted, 10 years in, as an officer. He was a reservist. I was commanding a reserve outfit. Not, yeah, they just, oh, whatever. Uh, that, I was active duty, but I, they had me uh, filling in on someone, and he couldn't speak English. It was basically he was from Puerto Rico, but he couldn't speak English. He couldn't write it. But I don't. He, he, he was an officer in the military and uh, with a bad attitude, and I had to call him babysit him. Why? And that was it. Was the personnel problem? And I mean, my soldiers, most of all my soldiers knew what to do. That's how we did so well. It's just dealing with these little personnel issues that were very taxing and very difficult uh, to deal with, especially that one guy. If I didn't, if I didn't have that guy on my, and I tried to get him out of the unit, I tried it, but it was just difficult and I couldn't do that. But he took up a lot of my time, just uh, making sure that he don't screw with anybody and, just, you know, be a bad influence. But uh, yeah, that, those were just personnel issues. <clears throat> the incoming rounds, we knew what to do. We knew how to do our jobs. We, and we did the base and in camp inspections. From I had about 18 camps out in reserve. RC West or uh, is a command west. We were out near Turkmenistan and Iran. That was just a big swath of area that we just went from helicopter to hel helicopter from base to base on hel helicopters and just enforced sanitation measures to make sure that you know the soldiers and the sailors or what have you didn't get sick from the own, our own stuff. So those were a few of the issues in Afghanistan that I had. And the piss hell does somebody become an officer in the military in the <laughs> United States military and they can't speak English? What the fuck? Exactly. So I think he was out of, he originally was from Puerto Rico and went into a reserve outfit down there near Miami. And I, know that. I think maybe he was in a, he was locked in some sort of a good old boy network. Wow. Uh, and uh, they just promoted him on. Um, uh -huh. And so, exactly. And he had a college degree. He even worked for them at, at the time. He was considered an engineer with the Veterans Administration out of Miami. That was a very unique and bizarre uh, thing. I mean, he would say, and also, if he, I said, just keep quiet. Don't say shit. Don't write emails to anybody. Just, you know, just, just, just stay there. And I'll, I'll give you an Army commendation. And just, you know, can you just shut up? I gave him a lot of counseling statements. That, that none of them did any good. And I tried to talk to him over and over and over again, but he just had a bad attitude. He was a disgruntled character. He, I, he wanted to be the commander. And I said, you know what? I'm a lieutenant colonel. How does a captain, how does a lieutenant colonel report to a captain? It doesn't work that way. I says, and he said, well, uh, they told me I was going to be the commander. I said, well, I'm the commander. I mean, that's just the way it goes. Uh, they, they put me in this job and so, uh, you know what, it, it was really, really petty. And, you know, it, it, beyond, if he was the commander, and let's assume that it doesn't work, let's, he would have been pissed off about something else. It would have been something else. Uh, so, I don't know. I think, I think, just think he was just a disgruntled, uh, mean, or just a bad character. 
But no, exactly. I've never seen someone in the military that couldn't speak or write English. They had basically just gone through the gates of life. He was an English. Yeah, he had been a captain. Ten years prior, he was an E6 in the reserves, and then he went over to become a lieutenant. And I have no idea. That is, I've got it in the book, changed his name, but that was one of the most bizarre things I've ever seen in my life. On the one hand, I, I, I can get behind the determination because where there's a will, there's a way, and there's exceptions made, you know, every day for people. But culturally speaking, to serve that long and not bother to learn the language, you know, of the country that you're serving is disrespectful. You know, it was, yeah, it was weird. It was weird. And, and, and the thing about it, he was he just, he would write these emails that were just, I'm not, it would just, you could see that he couldn't, and he would send them out to people. And I'm thinking, good Lord, you know, um, we're talking about really bad grammar. Very, very bad. And you could tell that he probably couldn't really understand. He was doing the best he could, but, uh, but yeah, I, bizarre. Some of these things are just bizarre. Yeah, exactly. And uh, yeah, I, I guess if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have had a whole lot to do in Afghanistan or other than just run away from bonds and things, but I had to, yeah. So now he, he, yeah, he, 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 he kept me busy and I, I got him out a little earlier, other soldiers, but that took some time to get him out there a little earlier. You talk about running away from bombs like you're just shopping for celery at the grocery store. You know? Yeah. That's, like that, that's, that's something. That, that's, that's, the, the life that we live in the military <laughs> is high octane and so fucking highly stressful, you know, but it, it really, really makes us super fucking strong because shit don't be phasing us. <laughs> you know, oh, yeah, thing. it's just another incoming. Okay. Or give me our, <laughs> all right, I know where to go. I know where to run or wherever. I <laughs> Do the do the accountability. Are you all there? Are you okay? Got all their equipment? Okay, we're cool. All right. Well, now the siren's off. There was an English woman that went on the loud. I don't know why it was an English woman. It was a rocket attack, rocket attack, and then and then, and then, then when it's all, and then that means you go into your bunker, and then it, when it's all clear, all clear, all clear. And I said, okay. It's over, and we were all go by. I remember. I remember. I, it was an e a sound of an English woman. I was like, "Wow, cool!" Uh, but now that happened all the time. And then you would hear rocket after rocket again, rocket attack. Maybe thirty seconds later, you would hear. <laughs> then you hear all the sirens. You had the rapid reaction force and come in to put out the fires or things of that nature. And then after that, it was done. And then pretty much go back to whatever you were doing. And that was just sort of a. Yeah, that was kind of a normal thing. Again, hats off to people who are strong enough to make it in the military. I think everybody should go to the military for a year or two, wait tables or do something that makes them put their, put their, direct their energy towards giving a fuck about somebody besides themselves. Some countries have certain things like that in place. And I think that they're way further along internally in character development than the United States is. The United States is a very, very fucked up country, generally speaking, in the way people go about dealing with each other, in my opinion. Yeah, I never knew anything more than the military. I joined so early, and that's all I ever did was serve, for the most part. And I just that just came with the territory and uh, serving others, teamwork, helping out others. You know, you help them out, we're going to help you out, you know, and what comes around goes around, be nice to everybody and take yeah. care of them and You'll see the thing, same things come back to you if you just take. I was good at commanding. I mean, commanding is just to me it was just so easy because it's just taking care of people. I mean, you take care of them, they take care of you. It works both ways. A lot of people think, well, you're a commander, and you can, you know, you're. No, they can also screw with you as well. So you want to take care of them extra special, so they don't do anything to screw up. And uh, so that's to me, it was pretty simple. I did two commands in the army. I mean, I did some executive officer time, and to me, that was just easy. My my father taught me how to take care of other people and, you know, help out and be a leader, and I thought that was easy. Yeah, yeah. That's not common. You know, out here, out, out, out here in these streets, man, people, you know, as, you know, as, 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 as Jesus said, you know, people, people are just becoming like more and more lovers of themselves. You know, and and that's and that's a huge reason why they they love themselves, but they're not in love with themselves. They like getting things and doing things. It's not it's not the same. So 
though, you probably, you know, you grew up around better stock. Now you say that you mentioned your, your father. In the book, you do talk about, you know, there was a fight. Things weren't always so like great. Can you talk to us about that particular instance? Yeah, so I got in a fight with my father. He was, first of all, my, my book is dedicated to my father. And also, uh, I love him very much. He was a wonderful father. He made me all, but you know, things weren't always perfect. But um, when I had a fight with him, it was what came out of that basic training. I was 18 years old. I was feeling really strong. And I was feeling very much of a badass. And he wanted to test. And uh, so he, you know, he was drinking some scotch one evening. And he started pushing me around and eventually he threw me to the floor and pinned me and I pinned him back. I threw him back and he threw me back and I, pick, I managed to pick his ass up and then he body slammed him on it. Back. I don't, I, it was just so fast. And we did it. Once I body slammed him, um, he goes, Oh, no more Jake. You call, you call me Jake. No more Jake. No more. I'm, I said, then so I don't think I kicked his ass in hindsight. I think that he allowed me to kick his ass and, uh, because he wanted to keep, I think he was proud of me and he got a little bit more, he got a little bit too uh, spirited and, and, and proud of me, I guess, uh, because he knew I had changed a whole lot coming back from basic training and he just wanted to test me a little bit. It was his own special little way of showing love. <laughs> <laughs> he was a really, really good father. He came from a white, white trash environment. I'm talking about. Uh, you know, years ago, everybody in the South was poor, but, you know, he came from, uh, you know, stealing food for a uh, garbage can or uh, just being like moved around house to house. He was not an orphan, but he was more like just, he was, he was an illegitimate child, bastard child, I guess. And he just moved and lived and survived how he did. And, and then he taught that to his sons and, and things. And, but not that we were, we were not white trash. He, he, we all had food. We had a stable home, but he always told us stories about how he lived. And he even taught us, he even taught us how to steal watermelons when we were young kids, like nine years, eight, nine years old. And he says, if you got to steal food to eat, go ahead and do that. We get poor. And it's like, no, we're not going to get poor. We're not going to become poor. And then he, he was also a character, a little bit of a rascal. And he shot, he taught me how to shoot bottle rockets, people in cars when I was a young, young kid too. And so he was a playful father. And. He said the big, the biggest rule was, sons, we can go out here and have fun and be like boys and things, and I teach you a lot of stuff, but you never say anything to mama, never say anything to mother or sister. Don't say, keep it here, and that you know. So I, we, I kind of grew up with a with, with a great father who taught us fun and leadership at the same time. That sounds like a pretty fucking good balance to me. A little play, a little work, you know, balance. Everything really boils down to balance in this life. Not too much of this, not too, not too little of that. Oh, yeah, we had to work. We had to work to make money. Sink or swim attitude. Hey, sons, you know, if you ain't making, if you ain't working you, at 18, you sink or swim. And I'll take care of you until then. And after that, it's all up to you. And he was kind of like that. He, 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 he did promote work. He did promote chores and saving money and. You know, the things of what you have to do around the house. And then when you get it, you need to get a job. I, I went in, I got a job when I was 14 in agriculture, uh, pecking you know, in a peach shed, in a peach shed packing house. And, uh, so no, he wanted us to work, learn the basics of just what it really means to make money and the pain associated with that. So, uh, but now he was, uh, he was a good father, very good father. Yeah. It sounds like he led y'all with a lot of intent. I wonder if, if that, what he instilled in you has something to do with. How, how at the beginning of this episode, I was talking to you about how you, how you don't compare yourself to other guys and other people. You understand the races against yourself. You sound very secure, very in touch with who you are and why you are, which is the antithesis of modern day American masculinity. I wonder if you got some of that from your dad. You know? Probably did. My father, a whole lot came out of my father. Got to understand him. I was diagnosed with a learning disability at age six or age seven. So I knew I was different and I knew I walked a different walk. And he, he knew that too. Uh, and he even told me that when I was growing up, he said, son, you, you're a little different. You, you beat to the drum of a, you know, you beat to the tune of a different drummer is what he used to call it. And um, he says, you know, that's okay. Whatever it takes, but just you know, never quit. Uh, he's sort of like, I understand you, Jake. I understand it. Uh, you're your man, uh, you know, that's cool. 
and uh, you be your own man. And uh, that's what he wanted. He wanted you to be, he wanted me to be, yeah, he wanted me just be your own man. And what the hell with everybody else, if that's the way it goes. And, and that's basically, yeah, I, I kind of wish I was a little bit more like with all those other guys and how they did things. But I, I knew that I was different from a very early beginning. And my dad also, he said, Hey Jake, it's okay. It's okay to be you. And, so he, he helped me out with that. Hmm, maybe that's a more parents thing to do. Just tell their fucking kids, verbally tell them, hey, it's okay to be you, and then repeat that shit. Because there's a, a lot of pe there's a huge identity crisis. A lot of these, a lot of people, especially males, don't know who the fuck they are. And, they, and it's not okay for them to be quirky or different or strange. I love what he did. He said, he, he took your supposed weaknesses and he turned them into a, he alchemized them and he made them strengths in your perception nobody wants to be you know typical you know different cells different different is what people notice different is good so i mean the weirder the better to me <laughs> <laughs> yeah he, he promoted it my, my my mother i had a challenging relationship with my mother she wanted to be she wanted me to be more in tune with everyone else more normal uh, whether it be my proper dressing proper whatever uh, things and proper i used to listen to hate williams jr he was a rock and belly type and so i was more on the redneck side of life and my, my mother was more in tune with the you know you know keeping the household straight and i was a little, little bit different so, yeah but uh, my, my father said son it's all right he would say son it's, cool. it's all cool he even he promoted he'd say that's all right and, but he did it secretly and i was listening more to my father which was more like and then my mother and but no uh, yeah, I think if they, if a lot of these kids had some male role models that would just sort of keep them straight, you know, they may not have a, you know, the father can still be an influence on their, on their kids, even if they're divorced or what have you, if they could just spend some time, you know, hanging out. And he did, he spent time with them. The time he, he worked a lot, but when he was there, he was there, he was with, uh, so he was there out, he was our, he was a baseball, well, he was a, he was like a, a baseball coach. And he would out, he'd be out there playing with us as well and hanging out and understanding the neighborhood, understanding the kids out there. And he enjoyed kids. I, I enjoyed kids as well. And I just sort of, I sort of just, I sort of mimicked his activity. So when I became a military person, it was like, it's all, all you do is take care of people, man. You just watch them, take care of them, talk to them, you know, and it's really, it's really was pretty simple just because of my father's, how he raised Who was that song? I looked into my father's eyes. Uh, the new one says to dance with my father. There are some good fathers out there. Some good, some, there's some good dads out there. And to, you know who you are. To you, I also commend you and take your hat off because raising a human is a big deal. Okay. So now, so I've appreciated this conversation. It kind of, it kind of felt like I'm talking, you know, back in the military, talking to you know, the good old colonel and everything. And, and I was around a lot of officers, even though I was not an officer, but because of the way I carried myself, I was invited into, um, you know, situations that exceeded my rank. So, so this has been pretty delicious. And so y'all, the book is, we're getting ready. I'm, I'm about to ask you three jokes. I forgot to tell you at the beginning of this, that I'm going to be asking you three dad jokes at the end, but the, the book that he's holding up, the holding back up, holding Holding up is called a soldier against. Oh, oh, look at that photo right there, Lieutenant Colonel Jason G. Pike. Look at those. That's when I was, that's when I was seventeen years old and got locked up in a criminal investigation division. That right there is when I'm a lieutenant colonel in Afghanistan. So yeah, this is a it's a memoir. I gave everything. I gave it all on this thing. You'll see all the good, bad, and the ugly. Yeah. He went to the hospital and everything for it, y'all. <laughs> yeah. And then, then, then a portion of these proceeds go to what? Go to where now? I, I, what I did, what I do is I, and there's not a whole lot of the, the price of the book is about at the most of the bottom level. I want people to get the story out. What I do give to veterans, all this will go to veterans. It could be the Wounded Warrior Project, or it could be the Update Warrior Solution nonprofit activities that help veterans out. So, no, I, I have I give to veterans uh, every year. Yeah. Absolutely. And so y'all, before I get to the jokes, his website is jasonpike.org. You can find him on Facebook, Instagram, I mean, LinkedIn, uh, yeah, Instagram and Twitter is where I saw the most activity when I was looking, looking you up and researching you. 
So we do a few bad jokes at the end of the shows these days, just to kind of lighten the mood. And so hopefully, you know, you get one. I don't think I've ever had anybody get more than one. <laughs> but did I have anyone that I don't think I had anyone that got two? But Okay, what did the proton say to the electron? You're too electric. <laughs> Almost. He, he, he said, stop being so negative all the time. <laughs> in, in that field, though, what happens when frogs park illegally? They hop around. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> they get towed. They get towed. <laughs> Okay. 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 You, okay. I think you'll get this one. Why are pediatricians always so angry? Oh, wow. You got me on. Why are they so angry? Too much screaming and yelling. I don't know. Because they have little patience. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. you got me there on that one. You got me on all of them, really. <laughs> Yeah, you can't, I guess a military mind might not do so good with these. You can't, these, they, you can't analyze it. You have to like this light to like float to you. Okay. It's been a while since I've had the jokes, but I appreciate your time, man. It's been great. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Any, I'll let you have the last word. Any words of encouragement that you might want to say to anybody, anything at all, and then you can close this out. Uh, JasonPike.org is my website, JasonPike.org. If you can leave me a review, any review. You. Even if you didn't read the book, that's cool. In other words, five star, good book. That would just, it just helps me out getting this thing out there. No, show up at the right place at the right time with the right attitude, and you'll be doing better than most people, even if you don't know a damn thing. So, no, um, hey, good luck, bud. Take care. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming on the show today, Colonel. All right. Thank you all so much for joining us today and for taking some time to invest into yourself and into the lives of your loved ones. Please visit us at sexdrugsandjesus.com and check out our resource page, our spiritual service offerings, my blog, my books, and other writings that God has partnered with me to create. Find us on any social media platform. Stay strong, my people, and just remember that everything is going to be all right.